everyone, and welcome to Channel 781 News. Um, today, we're going to be talking uh, with our debrief co correspondent, Tom Benavides, about housing development and displacement as it relates uh, to Waltham. Uh, Tom co-founded and helps lead Waltham Inclusive Neighborhoods, uh, which focuses on advocating for dense, smart housing in our city. Um, they've been doing great work pointing out good and bad development, how jobs relate to housing, and uh, and also just being uh, very present in the community, which is great. Um, I wanted to give Tom a chance to talk about how development relates to rental prices, uh, because in the philosophy of housing that Tom, along with uh, many urban planners, has um, the the idea that all housing, if done correctly, um, is good housing. A lot of people, especially on the left, um, including me, take issue with this kind of messaging uh, around how, like, you know, we don't believe that luxury condos or luxury housing um, is great for our community. We think that displaces people. We think that displaces marginalized people. Um, and so uh, while Waltham Inclusive Neighborhoods has been doing a great job uh, in conversations around jobs and development, um, I wanted to give Tom a platform to take a step back and and talk for, from like square one around development and rental prices. Um, and I'm not here to have a debate at all. Like I haven't come prepared for this conversation at all. Um, I just wanted to uh, give Tom the platform. He's been a great ally in a lot of these fights. And so just for him to be clear uh, and to really keep you on the record for where he's coming from and a lot of this. So I definitely wanted to give uh, Tom that platform to be able to do that. Um, and so I'm here to, you know, do some clarifying questions, uh, help lead the conversation a little bit, but uh, really excited about this. So thank you, Tom, for coming on and please take it away. Yeah, thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, as I said, I want to discuss the evidence and reality surrounding like, you know, what happens when new residential development happens in neighborhood how displacement works and how that's influenced by new development and just generally how we solve the housing crisis because we are currently in a housing crisis and inaction is not an option unless we just want to perpetuate the same rising home prices and continued displacement. So part one, just going to start this discussion with the foundational thing of everyone deserves a home and everyone needs a home. Now, I don't think anyone watching this video will disagree with this. Like foundationally, everyone needs a home. And this is like the fundamental that we are going into this discussion with. And from there, we also need to discuss the fact that more and more people need homes every year. Every year, there are tons of people who are like children who are leaving their parents' home and ready to live on their own for the first time. There are immigrants coming to Waltham in search of a better life, and they're coming to Waltham becoming new residents for the first time. And Waltham is building tons of new jobs all the time, which means there are new workers who were not here before who are now moving into Waltham. Like there are a lot of more people who are coming to the Waltham area every year. And all of these people need homes alongside the people who also already live here. And as a case study, we should look at 245 Fifth Avenue. This is the one of many developments, commercial developments that is currently happening in Waltham. Waltham is currently in the process of permitting like literally millions of square feet of commercial development. But this is one of those buildings that's currently being built in Waltham. And it will likely create roughly 600 or so jobs, meaning 600 or so new families will soon be moving to Waltham and the surrounding area. And I want to start this discussion just starting to like interrogate this primary question of like, if we are not building new homes, if we have no res new residential development, where are these 600 new families going to live? Uh, because they li will live in Waltham and the Waltham area. Everyone, very nearly everyone in the US lives within driving distance of the place where they work. And the answer to that question is displacement. If we don't build new housing, any new residents that are in any area, Waltham or any other, can only gain housing by displacing someone else. Generally, we're just going off the definition of displacement since we are dealing with a market economy. Who gets housing is largely predicated on who has money. And generally displacement happens by virtue of someone is no longer to live, able to live in their current home due to the rising cost of living. Chris, uh, how does that match with your conception of displacement? Do you think that's a fair definition? Do you feel like there are aspects of it missing or do you think that's a good like baseline to go from? I would say that that is an accurate definition of displacement. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, quickly uh, ask, you were just talking about um, 
people living where they work. But is that, is that true that, that people live where they work? Like statistically, is that true? Or that, and is it true that the people move to where they work? Because my brain tells me people move to where it's cheap and people are okay with commuting. Because I feel like that's a large part of living is, is commuting. Uh, but I'm also like poor and maybe that's just a poor person mentality of just going to where it's cheap. Uh, and maybe people with money, the people that, that have these jobs that you're describing, um, they are more willing to pay more money to live closer where they work. Oh, no, that's definitely true. And when I say people live where they work, they are living in the area within driving distance, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, okay. When people, when Waltham is creating jobs, um, the new workers who come here will not immediately move to Waltham. Many will choose to move to Waltham because that's the most convenient place to live. If you go to the, if you go to the 245 Fifth Avenue website, they will advertise like, hey, this is a great place to have your business. It's a great place for people to work because we are in Waltham. Waltham is a highly sought after place, which has like the highest percent of like educated millennials in the entire uh, Northeast, hmm. um, or at least Massachusetts. I forget the exact specifics they say, but if you if you Google 245 Fifth Avenue Waltham, you'll go to the website and you will scroll down and you will see that they are advertising for people to live in Waltham. Uh, and that's essentially actually how displacement works. You know, um, these new higher income people will move to Waltham. They will go for the most desirable housing, which is that which is near to where they work. And then that is, and that is how displacement happened. The people who are displaced have to live further and further from where they work to have, so that way they can have cheaper housing while still being able to access their job. In a worst case, it gets to such a degree, such as we're seeing now in Massachusetts, where there's no affordable housing for like miles and miles. And that's how you see things where people are straight up leaving the state um, because there's no affordable housing anywhere. Um, because fundamentally, you know, even when we take into account that like people aren't necessarily living only in Waltham, some people are living in Lincoln, as far as Framingham, like those places aren't building housing either, right? Year over year, as we are having more people um, come to Waltham, whether it's immigrants or just children leaving their parents' homes or whether it's new jobs, um, new jobs being the largest piece of the pie for Waltham specifically. Um, someone's gotta be building the housing. And it is my philosophy that Waltham should want to build the housing. So that way the people who are from here, the children who grew up here are able to continue living in Waltham if they want to. The immigrants who choose to move here are able to move, live in Waltham if they want to. And the people who are coming to Waltham for work, um, they should be able to live here without displacing those who already exist here. Do you feel like that addresses uh, your point or? 100%. Okay, cool, cool. So examples of displacement are like, you know, a landlord will raise his rent because he knows that there are people where like, if he raises his rent, he knows that like, even if the current tenant can't afford it, there's some someone out there who will be able to afford it, who's higher income. Um, so that's one mechanism of displacement. Um, another example is like a homeowner sells their home for a lot more than they bought it for because they know the market is tightened. And therefore, that home, which used to be accessible to someone who was a lower income, is now no longer accessible to low income uh, family. Another example is a cheap home being knocked down and replaced with an expensive home. Uh, oftentimes in Waltham, we see these being referred to as McMansions, where basically you have a 300k single family home, which is really run down uh, and accessible to like lower income families. But it, it can also just be taken up by developers, smashed down, replaced with a really big and really fancy single family home which is now you have housing, which was once accessible to lower income families, is, was once accessible to lower income families and is now no longer accessible. But these all kind of work by the same mechanism where you, know, you have a house, which is worth a certain amount of money and a person is living there. And there are a bunch of people who are looking for housing in this neighborhood uh, at a variety of income levels. And when that person leaves, whether it's because they are forced out by their landlord or they are choosing to move, um, you know, the cost, the value of the home goes up either because the housing market is tightened because we have a housing shortage or because the landlord raised rents explicitly to kick them out or because it was bought up by developer and redeveloped into nicer housing. In all these cases, you know, there is the inevitable fact that when a person leaves their home, 
they are selling they are selling it or it is going on to someone who makes more money than them and you know the richest person is able to afford it or the richest person who's willing to pay for that home is able to afford it and then everyone else sort of left the wayside and Waltham becomes sort of like less affordable by virtue of that this is where there might be a bit of controversy because i'm going to go over what isn't displacement um which i will follow, follow up on data to support this because this sort of like, like is the crux of this entire video uh, but to start out with what isn't displacement is luxury housing built on empty or commercial land. Uh, because prior to these dense homes existing, there were zero people living in all these places. Uh, I have Longview Apartment, which used to be a parking lot for a hospital. Edison, which used to be um, industrial land. We have Cronin's, uh, which used to be a department store. And we have the right, which is the new 40B development on 2nd Avenue near Bear Hill Road, which used to be um, what the Walthing Channel described as derelict uh, industrial buildings. So this is a displacement because there was no one there to be displaced. You know, this is a place where previously no one was housed and now you are housing literally hundreds of people there out of right incomes as well, like lux these luxury houses don't only house um, rich people also because of things like inclusionary zoning, which means that there are affordable units as a part of these. This is also housing people at moderate incomes and low incomes, uh, which do have like government defined income restricted definitions. This isn't something you have to trust luxury developers on. The government is stepping in, deed restricting these units and saying like, hey, these are only available to people at certain income levels and they can only be rented out at this certain price point. And now more broadly, I know that sometimes a concern addressed about this is gentrification, the idea that this will affect surrounding areas. And that is something that I will discuss in a later part when we get into the data. But yeah. I mean, yeah, that that is, I mean, you're right. This is the crux of the argument. So mm -hmm. like many people, myself included, and you know, we've been talking talking this for a long time. So like I am open to being wrong about this, but many, many people. Uh, including people that disagree with me on many other things, we all generally agree that places like the Merck, like Cooper Street, the development raises the rent in the surrounding area because they mm -hmm. are many many of their units are luxury units that cost way more than what people can afford. And then we believe that the landlords in the surrounding area they see these dollar signs. And then they raise their rents, not to that level, but to more than what they currently own, uh, currently are at, because that is just like, that's the, that's just the flow of the conversation. Why wouldn't they do that? Because it's still cheaper than the Merck. That's just, that's what most people believe. That's what I believe. And, sure. you know, I, I'm interested to hear what you said. Yeah, no, and that is not a small thing. We are going to discuss that. Um, researchers generally call that the amenity effect, the idea that nice new housing in the nearby area signals to landlords that they can raise rents. Uh, so yeah, we will get into that. We do explore what the actual reality is uh, beyond, yeah. Um, and then what also is a displacement, we will argue, I will argue, is high density housing replacing low density housing. Uh, example we have is the Pond Street 40B, which is just, you know, um, it is mostly replacing uh, industrial buildings, but there are also a few one and two unit buildings, uh, residential buildings that are replaced. Uh, but fundamentally, you know, it's still, I would argue it still is a displacement because A, this dense development is creating dozens of income restricted affordable units, which are more deeply affordable than what was replaced on top of uh, providing like hundreds of more units of housing. Okay, but what about the people that were living in those units before it got torn down? Because it's, I mean, the place I lived in be right before this place um, was on Francis Street. And uh, me and the family I was living with got a notice that said, you know, where is selling the property and or, or the building on it. I, I forget exactly. I, didn't, I forget exactly what it said. Mm -hmm. um, but you have 30 days to leave. Um, and so uh, is that not displacement? Yeah, and then uh, if it, you might, don't mind asking as well, uh, what kind of luxury development was it replaced with? Like, uh, I, I wish I wish I could I wish I could tell you. I um, mean, is it one of the big apartment buildings or was it like a low density? No, it was a low density. Yeah, so first off, this is that is when it fall into what I'm arguing for. That is definitely displacement. Um, 
because you're replacing currently existing affordable housing with uh, high end expensive housing that fits to like the description I was describing earlier. Of, like, fair, fair, fair point. Fair point. But what about the people yeah. that live in that low density housing? What, what are they? What are they? Yes. That's not displacement. No, yeah, and that and that is very valid. So the reason I argue it's not displacement is because these people who are living there are gaining access uh, to more housing, which is more deeply affordable. And also, this isn't something they should be left out to dry for. Um, they might have because our the current laws are shittily enforced, which is why things such as the housing rights notification ordinance are so important, and which is why. Waltham Inclusive Neighborhoods, alongside many other groups, has been strongly advocating for that. But in Waltham, we have an anti-displacement ordinance, which says if you are a low to moderate income person or a low to moderate income family who is living in a building that is about to be redeveloped, you have a legal right where the developer needs to provide you with affordable housing. What that means is that they need to, I'll just read it out to you. Um, where a proposed development which is subject um, to this displaces any households which are earning less than 80% of the area median income, which is like low to moderate income households um, that would qualify for affordable housing. These households shall be offered affordable dwelling units um, and the replaced units must have at least the same number of bedrooms as unit being replaced. Um, and the developer must provide uh, moving expenses, technical assistance, and that must equal or exceed three times the cost of monthly rent. And the priority for the location of this top boy unit is um, first, they should try to provide for you in the same building, if not in the same neighborhood, if not in the same neighborhood in Waltham and only then will they start living nearby communities. So it keeps people housed, it keeps people in the same community uh, okay. at minimal financial cost. Now I will say um, Waltham, um, I don't like giving credit to Waltham because Waltham's current law is kind of suck. And this current law does kind of suck because this current law only applies in cases such as this, where um, low density housing is being replaced by high density housing. In, in cases like yours, where you are um, like you are being pushed out because your affordable housing is being developed into luxury housing that isn't like isn't affordable in any way, like pon the Pond Street development is that law does not this law does not apply you are still left out to drive because waltham would consider that too burdensome for these small scale developers right okay um so I, i'm on i'm on i'm on board with everything yeah. right now mm -hmm. but still you know all of these protections that you're talking about they have to provide these things those people are still being displaced mm -hmm. that's still displacement all right you would still consider that displacement which i think of course is, they're moving they have to move mm -hmm. I mean, if, yeah. if, if, you, if what you're saying is true, which also I just learned, I did not know any of this. Mm -hmm. if, all, if what you're saying is that they have to provide reasonable accommodations to affordable housing, that's great. Um, mm -hmm. I would be very surprised if that works out. I'd, I've never heard of this happening. Uh, I've never heard of this working out before. Mm -hmm. uh, I would still classify that as this person. Okay. Which I, I think is fair. Like, that's generally a fraught thing where, like, it is, like, is it's generally just like the argument against like stasis against any kind of change get any kind of change does require you know change and it's it's like the same issue where you know like if you know if we have to replace one single family home uh to create like a ton of affordable apartments like you're still displacing that one person and of course yeah. the degree to which that affects you will change but i would I would argue that it's at least a net benefit when you are gaining more affordable housing than you lost. You are and able then, to house yeah. more people, including the people who currently exist there. They will still be able to live in this community. Mm -hmm. even though and, yeah, yeah. So, totally. And also what we're talking about is I think kind of rare because what you're literally with this very specific Super example rare. of of turning low density, a bunch of low density housing into high density housing. Um, is a very niche thing that doesn't really happen now. Yeah, that is also a really good point to make because yeah, this is super niche. Waltham has tons of land where it is illegal to build housing. And then we have a ton of land where it's like only industrial lots that are largely underutilized and vacant where like we can and should be building housing. Like replacing existing housing should never be the first go. Um, it should never be a priority. Um, and luckily, it very rarely is. And this isn't by accident. It's not a coincidence that I was only able to find one example of like 
of low density housing being replaced by high density housing. This is intentionally just like as a function of our anti-displacement ordinances and just like generally the ease of which it is to like develop vacant lots as opposed to places where people already live. Like there are a lot of current protections for existing renters and homeowners um, against large scale developments that make this incredibly rare. Um, there, those, those protections don't exist for like small scale, against small scale developers, which is why in cases like yours, you still get fucked over. Um, but for like large scale development, this is incredibly rare for those reasons, yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for that pushback. Cause this generally is like a very like iffy, iffy situation where like you are making Waltham more affordable, but in the process, like some people, renters specifically will have to move maybe against their will, yeah. And, and again, the philosophy of is that high density housing going to be cheap? You know, we talk about, you know, it's going to be cheap, but is that true? Yeah, so with that in mind, I would like to go to my next slide, part 2.5, which is inclusionary zoning, uh, which when we when I say that these dense units also provide like government mandated like affordable housing, this is like not so like this is not something you have to trust developers on. You don't have to worry about them claiming it's affordable and it's not actually affordable. These are government defined definitions. Uh, and generally Waltham and their inclusionary zoning ordinance, they require two types of housing. Um, require moderate income housing, uh, which is affordability restrictions for moderate incomes, uh, which on average ends up being about $850 cheaper than average market rate rents in Waltham. And there are also uh, income restrictions for low income, uh, for low income families, in which case the average rent ends up being restricted to like $2,000 cheaper uh, than the average market rate rent in Waltham. Um, and so for the Pond Street example, for example, that I just showed, um, that was creating, I believe like, uh, God, I wish I had the numbers in front of me, but it's, I believe it was roughly 40 moderate income restricted units and then 10 low income restricted units. I believe those that was the breakdown. Yeah. Um, so even just counting like the the units that were like torn down, replacing with far more low income affordable housing, not even to mention the moderate income affordable housing. I want to be clear, there is like no trust involved with developers in this case. Like there is no trust. This is like government mandated. Like they do not get to choose their own definition for affordability. These are handed down uh, by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, that define, hey, this is what moderate income in Waltham is. This is what low income in Waltham is. Um, and if you want to read the slides below, it breaks down specific numbers for specific cases. But yeah. So inclusionary zoning is something that comes under the city council a lot. This is something that um, that the city council really uh, advocates for and um, and points to as to say like this is what we've done to increase affordable housing in Waltham. And like inclusionary zoning is good. But uh, the issue, um, which I've talked about in our, in our GPF episodes before, um, is that it hasn't created that many units over the years that it's existed. Yeah, it has created 100 units of affordable housing in the past 20 or so years. Yeah. Um, and yeah, which is a lot more than, that's actually our number one source of affordable housing right now, yeah. more than yeah. from any other source. Uh, yeah. But it's still not enough. And functionally, you know, when Waltham makes it illegal to build its housing, which is how inclusionary zoning happens, like you're not going to get aff affordable housing unless you've legalized this to be built, you know, and Waltham is super resistant to that. So they're yeah. just, you know, they're trying to on paper do as much as they can while intentionally shooting themselves in the foot uh, by making this kind of housing illegal. So that way there's not actually that much being built. I'm trying to keep in mind another benefit of dense housing. Um, yeah, now we're going to discuss part three, which is just like addressing the concerns about gentrification. So we're going to discuss what happens in a neighborhood when a big luxury uh, housing uh, development is built, what happens to the people in the immediately surrounding area? Uh, and the answer is that new housing benefits everyone. Um, so to start with, I'm just gonna cover the effects of upzoning. And this is what happens when you immediately legalize new housing. This isn't when you build it, it's just like when, uh, when you legalize dense housing to be built. And what these graphs represent is basically if you just imagine this line up and down as a road. Uh, on the left side of this road 
are is a place where it is only legal to build like single family homes and on the right side of this road it is legal to build like denser multifamily housing um this is exactly what the study looked for by the new england public policy center they looked for areas in new england where it was just a boundary between low density zoning and high density zoning and they just compared like okay this is the exact same neighborhood just one side of the street and the other based on the legality of building denser housing is it more or less expensive and they found for both rents and for home prices on the side of the road where you are not allowed to build dense housing rent costs and house prices were higher and then on the other side of that road um they were lower and that when these changes rent skated you know if you up if you up zone if you make denser housing legal um rents and home prices go down if you make it illegal rents and home prices go up one important caveat from the study though which is kind of self-evident uh just changing the multifamily zoning would neither increase the supply of rental properties nor lower rents you have to increase unit density and that's what would do both and what that means is that we have some what I consider stupid zoning laws. Um, many professional academics would consider them uh, racist and classist and exclusionary zoning laws. But what it does is basically zoning laws were created in Waltham in the 1950s. And prior to 1950s, there was a lot of dense construction going on. All of, almost all of Southside was built prior to the 1950s. Uh, and then in the 1950s, Waltham created a bunch of zoning laws, which made it illegal to build that dense housing. Like nothing very little of what exists in Southside today would be allowed to be built today uh, because of our current zoning laws. Uh, so for example, uh, currently in Southside, it's roughly at a density of 15 units per acre, but we only have it legal to where you can practically build like five or six units per acre. If we suddenly up zoned Southside to go from six units per acre to 15 units per acre, what this study is saying is that would do jack shit. That wouldn't do anything for affordability because you're not increasing the supply of rental properties and therefore not lowering rents. In order for us, in order for us to see positive effects, you have to actually increase unit density. And what that means is like, I mean, A, if you do it up to like twice, if you legalize it to be twice as it says it currently is, you'll see it more affordable. But as you mentioned earlier, um, encouraging redevelopment of places where people are, already exist isn't necessarily the best uh, course of action because it displaces people. The far better thing to do is go at the places where like there's really low dense housing, such as like all these single family neighborhoods down by this um, commuter rail station or anywhere <laughs> literally across most of Waltham actually. Or if we go to these undeveloped um, industrial areas along like Felton Street or up here along Lexington Street, like upzoning those areas, um, that is where you would see the benefits because you are actually increasing the actual amount of housing that would be allowed to be built. Um, so does that caveat, caveat make sense? 100%. Yeah. So for example, we currently have the MBTA Communities Act coming through, which requires Waltham zone, a lot of its housing, um, to 15 units per acre. If Waltham decided to up zone south side um, to 15 units per acre, would we technically be legalizing more housing? Yes. Would we technically be complying with the MBTA communities law? Yes. Would we be improving Waltham's affordability? No. Um, all we'd be doing is making it slightly easier for developers to do teardowns and replace uh, our city with the exact same density, just more expensive, which, as we covered earlier, is just more displacement. Um, yeah, you got to actually increase the amount of housing that can be built there for, for you to see benefits is in regards to affordability. Um, and this is very well studied. It's not just a phenomenon unique to this one study. Like it is very well documented that if you increase the housing supply across the region, you will see home prices improve. Um, but the big concern and the big thing we want to address is what happens to nearby rents when a luxury apartment is built in a low income neighborhood. So if you have a place where people are lower income than the surrounding area and you put a luxury development right smack in the middle, do we see gentrification? Do their rents rise? Um, because that is the big concern. Um, and the answer is no, we do not. Um, uh, so two studies that I've been pulling on to do this mainly, one out of MIT, another out of uh, Portland State. Uh, yeah, and both come to very similar conclusions where uh, eviction rates drop significantly. Uh, both found that rents go down by five, roughly five to 7% uh, in the surrounding low-income areas. 
Uh, the new housing, because what the new housing does is basically it absorbs all the high, a lot of the high income households in the area. Um, and then the most significant thing, the most important thing is that you can then see that immigration to this low income neighborhood from other low income neighborhoods increases. You are able to see that more people who are low income are now able to live in this neighborhood because the high, the new luxury housing has absorbed the high income housing and income has dropped or and the rents have dropped. Um, and the way this works sort of like on principle is like the opposite of displacement where um, the, the study people call this the supply effect where if you suddenly add a bunch of new housing, those that can afford to move the new housing will move to the new housing. And then the remaining house, whether it's like they're trying to resell it, the previous owner's trying to resell it or whether it's a landlord trying to rent it out to someone else you know, there are a lot fewer high income people to rent to, so they have to lower the price to cater to the low income people who remain. Um, and I'm just going to keep talking before we address questions, because I know this feels mm -hmm. like iffy for a lot of uh, folks, but so th these studies also very specifically looked at gentrification, and they did it through something they call the amenity effect, which basically refers to the idea that new construction attracts wealthy households, it brings new amenities such as fancy restaurants and coffee shops, and it signals to landlords that they are able to increase rents. Um, which are there, are there other, any other further amendments you want to add to that, Chris? I feel like this pretty lines pretty much lines up with how we discussed gentrification earlier. Yep. Okay. Um, and what Richard found is that gentrification was like the amenity effect was visible, but gentrification wasn't happening because it was far outweighed by the supply effect, which is to say. You can look at the data, you can see that there are an increase in wealthy households in an area because you have all this new house, wealthy housing. You do see an increase in restaurant openings um, to cater to these folks. But rent costs and eviction rates still de decrease in the surrounding area despite that, which is to say, you know, the existing rented residents in the Solon neighborhood both receive improved amenities and affordability improves, which is sort of the best of both worlds. Um, because, I mean, the summary for like a lot of this discussion and a lot of the principle behind this is that like the reason our current zoning laws were created to make it illegal to build dense housing and like where single family homes are the only thing allowed across most of like Waltham in many areas is segregation. You know, these laws were made in the midst of white flight. They wanted to keep single family neighborhoods solely full of like, you know, rich folks who could afford it, um, which correlates very heavily with race, especially back when these laws were first created in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and they downzoned our dense neighborhoods because they wanted to make sure no other dense housing could be made, which is able to house these lower income families. Um, and just to go through the graphs that these sites provided, you can see that, um, yes, you see the, the immigration rate of high income families increase, but you also see the immigration rate of low income families also increase to an area. That's what these mean, just like, this is people from people above average wealthy neighborhoods and people from uh, below average uh, income neighborhoods. Um, you can see that um, this is how rent changes low income neighborhoods and it also controls for various different factors. Uh, you can see actually most heavily affected just uh, looking at these studies is the low percentage white neighborhoods, which is say like the more a heavily majority minority neighborhoods, um, they're the ones who see the, saw the biggest decreases in rent because of this. Um, but generally across, no matter how you slice it, whenever you're looking at a low income neighborhood um, and new housing is built immediately in the area, rents will decrease regardless of the quality of that housing. Um, and then, yeah, and this is just like the rent change over time where you can see year zero, which is when the new construction is built, seeing immediately drop at rents. And that that lowering of rents stays sustained over time. Like it's not like it immediately shoots back up. The rents stay low. You see lasting benefits from this decreased rent. What what cities are these? The study looked at the new construction of 1,483 new luxury buildings, uh, which means like, you know, they're not income restricted and they're 50 units or greater. Um, and they looked at it across 11 different cities across the US, Atlanta, Austin, Chicago, Denver, Los Angeles, New York City, Philadelphia, Portland, San Francisco, Seattle, and Washington, DC. 
Um, all of these are cities which have very similar uh, housing dynamics uh, to Waltham and Boston our area, which is to say uh, it's a desirable area. They're having a lot of new uh, job creation. They're having a lot of displacement due to rising uh, housing costs. Um, and then if I go back, you can see they controlled for a few different things while looking at all these cities. Um, they like it, okay, um, New York is like a large city that probably like waits this day. So I was if you remove New York. Um, no pioneer means like they looked at situations where it's a, it's a low income area where no luxury housing exists and suddenly it's luxury housing in this low income area for the first time, uh, which they call pioneer buildings. It's the first luxury development in a low income area. They also looked at areas where there's no pioneers, where it's like only there's already luxury housing in this low rise, uh, in this low income neighborhood. What happens if we have more luxury housing? Uh, they also looked at, um, exclusively uh, like lower income neighborhoods. They looked at exclusively like majority minority neighborhoods. Um, and they had a few different methodologies um, with how they measured it. It was like near far and near near, which um, I don't know if it's necessary to do. It basically just changes their control group, whether they're looking, whether they're comparing the rents to areas like immediately outside the study area or if they're comparing it to far areas with similar market demographics, but either way you see a reduction in rents regardless. Um, yeah, that just dives a bit into the methodology of like where this data comes from. It comes from across the US in cities with very similar market dynamics to the Boston area. And do you have any other questions? Cause I, I know it up a lot and it's like, it's okay to say like, I don't trust this data if there are any specific things that you don't trust or you think look suspicious, but like. Um, um, I mean, yeah. I. I you have a study that says this thing, uh, but you know, in our day-to-day -day life, the Merck and Cooper Street gets built, uh, which is higher development, but our rents went up. Uh, that's the lived experience. But you're saying either that's just a coincidence because everything just costs more money and we're not building enough housing, or it just wasn't done correctly because there wasn't enough of it that it actually, our, that's why our rents went up. Yeah, no, which is a fantastic point. And I think that's worth addressing. We'll address that because like, you know, we have seen <laughs> housing get built and rents are still going up. So what, what fucking gives, right? That's a very reasonable thing uh, to worry about. Um, so I'm gonna discuss that real quick. Just first, I'd like to clarify and reemphasize that none of these studies are hypothetical. These are not researchers who are like inventing models like, oh, this is how we think people will behave based on market dynamics. No, this was them like, looking at specific cities where housing was really built uh, in real low income neighborhoods and seeing what the effect on the surrounding areas were. There is nothing hypothetical about this. This is- Okay, so yes, yeah, yeah. there's very real examples of things happening, but yeah. mm -hmm. you're saying that gentrification didn't happen in those cities because your definition of displacement allows people to be pushed out to something affordable somewhere else, but to the people that are living in those neighborhoods, what they see are being people being pushed out. So you're saying that those people's so, the definition of gentrification is just not no. their definition of gentrification. Uh, so no, because, um, yeah, which is why it's so important to see that. Um, so basically this is low income neighborhoods where um, dense housing is built in it. Like these low income, this low income housing still exists. These people living in these low income housing aren't being displaced because they're seeing their rents decrease, right? They aren't being displaced at all. Um, this is, what happens when a luxury apartment is built in your backyard and the low-income people who live in that neighborhood are seeing their rents decrease. They're not getting pushed out. Um, okay. And importantly, we're not only seeing that, but seeing it becoming more accessible, we're not only are the current low-income residents able to continue living there because of reduced rents. Uh, and that also is justified by the um, drop in eviction rates as well. Like less people are being displaced, less people are being kicked out of their homes than before. Okay, um, I'm on board. Yeah. And also not only that, we're also seeing an uptick in people from other low-income neighborhoods who are able to move here now. Not only are people being displaced less, we're also seeing the city becoming more inclusive and more um, available to other low-income people who want to move here. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm on board again. Yeah, and we're also seeing an increase in high-income people that live here, but that's just because you know that is the effect of building more housing more of everyone is able to live here. Mm -hmm. That's like basically the whole point I'm trying to get across.
right? Yeah, build more housing, the city becomes more inclusive and more uh, accessible to literally everyone, whether you're high income or low income. But yeah, we're seeing a housing demand and we're still having a fucking housing crisis where it's going up, so what gives? Um, so just to reiterate, go to the very beginning, you know, more and more people need homes every year. Um, and we aren't building enough homes. That is my argument, essentially, that we aren't building enough homes. Um, you can see that nationwide, uh, there was a huge slump uh, post-2008 financial crisis, and it's only just now getting back to pre-that levels of home construction. Um, New England, Northeast never recovered, actually. New England is building less housing than anyone else. Uh, go to the metro Boston area, it gets even worse. Um, this isn't home construction level, this is like home availability level. Um, just because when you get more and more granular, it's hard to find specific data. Um, but generally, home availability is decreasing in the Boston area. Uh, and Waltham as well, you can see that it's steady downward decline. We're building less housing than we ever have before. And while there has been a recent uptick, it's not quite enough to cancel out, you know, the basically no housing we were building post financial crash. Um, so we're building less housing historically than we ever have before. Um, uh, and this is largely because, as I've discussed, um, our zoning code sucks and it makes it illegal to build dense housing that was, you were allowed to build way back when, like, um, like these huge spikes in home construction, that's, or, no, actually all this data is post um, zoning code, but basically, even before this graph, like, you could build a lot more housing, but now it's something illegal to build, so that's one thing we're not building much. Like, genuinely, if your home is older than 50 years, it's probably legal to be built today. Um, and as a case study, I'm going to dox myself a little bit and discuss my home. Um, this is a four family home. Uh, it was built originally as a single family home around like 1900 and converted to a condo a little over 50 years ago. Um, and this home, well, and this home is very familiar. This kind of home, just like a dense converted, like multifamily home is incredibly common. Like Wal south side of Waltham and pretty much most of Waltham south of Main Street is completely like covered with this kind of home. But this is illegal to build across like almost all of Waltham. Um, the areas I've highlighted here, this area where the Hope Ave redevelopment is, Longview Place, that's the only place where this would be allowed to be built by right. And this area highlighted is the only place where you'd be able to build this housing currently by special permit. Everywhere else in Waltham, it is, it's like generally illegal, gen genuinely illegal to build this unless you have like very heavy like zoning variances or like special cases with what existed prior to that. All the housing that was built prior to like the 1960s that most people would consider affordable, that people are worried about being torn down for new developments, um, they're straight up illegal to be built today. Uh, and that's why like all the affordable housing we see is so goddamn old. Uh, because while they makes it illegal to build affordable housing today, we're only allowed to build low density luxury developments, which is why we see those like million dollar like duplexes in South Side or single family homes, which is why we're seeing like so many like $2 million McMansion's pocket up all across uh, the rest of Waltham. Um, and a common thing I say here for like, oh, why Waltham isn't building a lot of housing, people like to claim that Waltham doesn't have the space for housing, but I very strongly disagree with this simply because Waltham is developing all the time. The only thing is Waltham ex almost exclusively uh, permits commercial development, which brings new workers and heavily discriminates against housing development. So you have a situation where like Waltham is building tons and tons of office spaces. I mentioned earlier, like Waltham is literally currently permitting millions of square feet of office development and nowhere near that amount of housing. Um, and that is essentially the issue, you know, if we're not building enough housing to keep up with the children that are leaving their parents' homes and looking for their own place, if we aren't building enough housing to keep up with the new immigrants who are coming to Waltham, if we aren't building enough housing to keep up with all the new workers that we are bringing to Waltham area, those people will displace the people who currently exist in Waltham. And that is what has been happening. That, will, that is what will continue to happen unless we change this unbalanced pattern. This is genuinely like, if this looks extreme, like this disparity, it genuinely is extreme. I've been spot checking like so many cities across New England, and I have been unable to find a single city in all of, the North, in all of New England who has such a heavy disparity between how many jobs they create and the number of workers they house. Um, like even Boston, it's like a two to one ratio. Uh, 
but in Waltham, like for every one home we have, there are three workers that Waltham brings to the area. And these Waltham job numbers are also old. These are 2017 versus the home number of 2021. I haven't been able to find any more recent jobs data, but with all the current development, with all the current commercial development uh, that Waltham is doing, like this will easily hit 90 uh, by the time all the current, this will easily hit 90K jobs by the time all the currently permitted development finishes. Um, and Waltham's housing numbers are not increasing to nearly that degree. Um, yeah, and just this is our zoning map. So for reference, um, all the current commercial development is happening on like these gray and light blue areas, which is to say like this area, this area along Lexington Street, uh, up and down like the river, Felton, a lot of this, it's illegal to build housing. Um, the gray and blue areas down here and all the way up along 128, as well as up here near the reservoir. All of these are places where there's currently tons of commercial development and Waltham makes it illegal to build housing. So this is why we have this huge disparity because Waltham set aside all this space where it is illegal to build housing and you are only allowed to build job developments. So that's why we see this huge imbalance. We're seeing like so much job development and so many new people coming to Waltham, but we're not building enough housing to house them and they need a place to live. So they are displacing those who currently live here. Mm -hmm. um, and just graphically, just to like further highlight the disparity, um, each blue person represents a thousand, oh, oops, each blue person represents a thousand workers. Uh, this is how many workers Waltham had circa 2017. These two green people represent the roughly 2,000 uh, college students who um, are not housed by university housing. So they are like, you know, competing for housing with the rest of Waltham residents. And this represents the 26,000, these 26 homes represent 26,000 housing units that Waltham has. Uh, so even if you go off of, you know, like the average house, house has roughly one and a half working people in it. Uh, and we'll say, you know, uh, most college students have roommates, so like the average house has two college students for it. Um, that's still 44,000 people um, who Waltham brings to Waltham and the surrounding area who are immigrating to Waltham but do not have places to live. Uh, and in response, and like, you know, a lot of these people do live in surrounding communities like Lincoln and Weston um, and like as far out as Framingham uh, in places which do have a lot of housing, but like those places are also having housing crises. Like those places are also like hurting for housing. And when Waltham is currently adding like potentially like 10 new people to this list in the past decade, like all of us in the surrounding areas combined, like <laughs> Weston doesn't want to fucking build housing. Like, you know, it's not like these other places are magically building housing when we're constructing all this commercial development. Uh, you know, um, someone has to build yeah. housing and Waltham, if Waltham is building the jobs, like Waltham should also be building some housing and not yeah, just- that was, that was, that was one of, Yeah, that was one of my questions. Places like, uh, like Brookline, Jamaica Plain, Salem, these are relatively affordable places. Are you saying that they're just not aggressively building jobs or are they aggressively building housing? Like why are, why are some places in Massachusetts cheaper than others? Uh, because I don't really see this aggressive housing uh, development that you're talking about being done anywhere or maybe I'm just not seeing. No, yeah, no, genuinely aggressive housing development isn't being done anywhere. That is why the state passed the MBTA Communities Act. Yeah. It is because like statewide, no one is building housing. So we need everyone to contribute at least a little bit. So yeah, with that in mind, part five, back to the beginning, foundationally, um, like the reason we need more homes is because everyone deserves a home. Uh, and that can only happen if we build enough homes to house everyone. And there should be no winners and losers when it comes to housing. Like foundationally, that is it. Um, because like there are a lot of good policies that can happen to like mitigate the harms uh, to low-income folks, uh, such as renter protections and like uh, you, uh, like affordable housing reduction, which reserves homes for uh, low-income families, and that does redistribute the housing in a more just way, where you know it's not like all the people on the left are low-income and all the people on the right are rich. You know, some people, some low-income folks do get housed through those uh, methods. That is very important for housing justice. But that doesn't change the fact that you have a lot of people who don't have homes and everyone needs a home. Um, like this should be the future we are fighting for. You know, everyone has a home. Um, 
and it's not just me saying this, the Waltham Community Day Center, who works with unhoused folks during their speech at um, the Housing Justice Summit this past spring, they explicitly said we need more housing. The Greater Boston Interfaith Organization, which is an alliance of faith groups across the Boston area, uh, currently have a housing justice campaign advocating for public housing uh, and uh, housing for returning citizens. But one of the central pillars for this is that one of their four central pillars that they have identified is the MBTA Community Center. Because they know that a cornerstone of housing justice is just the fact that we need more housing. The Massachusetts Department of Transportation also acknowledges the fact that we need more homes. Uh, they recently released a final draft of a land use study for the 128 corridor, which is where Waltham is building almost all its jobs. And they called out uh, Waltham and our surrounding communities because if we're building a ton of jobs and not legalizing any homes near those jobs, not only is it harming affordability, it is also like worsening traffic and pollution and climate change because people have to drive further and further to get to these jobs. Um, like the lack of housing in Waltham has gotten so extreme where like, even though like these workers are currently displacing um, existing Waltham residents, there still is enough housing for them. So like half of the people who work along 128 are commuting more than 10 miles to get to Waltham because there is no housing around here, which is like a huge disparity. So MassDOT also knows we need more homes. Uh, the Massachusetts State Legislature, Legislature acknowledges it, uh, hence the MBTA Communities Act. The Healy administration acknowledges it, hence um, the Attorney General's um, insistence on enforcing the MBTA Communities Law, and also the Healy, administrating, the Healy administration appointing a housing secretary for the first time in 30 years, which is very exciting to address this affordability issue. We have Elizabeth Warren, who has been fighting for more housing and has actually led legislation a few years ago um, to provide funds to municipalities who increase their housing supply. And that has actually been manifested in the Biden administration, who for the first time ever, I think, there are now grants available to cities uh, predicated on their ability to construct more housing to fight the housing crisis. Um, so yeah, this is like sort of like a broad array of people who have acknowledged this far from a comprehensive list. Uh, but also most persuasively, I like to point out the folks who are opposing more housing because of these exact same reasons. They know that more housing will fight the housing crisis and they enjoy profiting off the housing crisis. This includes uh, homeowners who are not particularly tuned into social justice, who only treat their houses as investment vehicles and therefore want to see uh, their home values rise. This includes real estate agents whose profits scale with home costs based on their commissions. And this also includes corporate landlords who do not want to see their homes reduce, their um, rents reduced, they don't want to see their profit reduce and therefore very much profit off of a housing shortage. Uh, and this isn't just me saying it. Um, I am going to close this out with a few quotes. This is from the SEC filings of Invitation Homes. Invitation Homes is a former su subsidiary of Blackstone, and their whole business model is they buy up homes uh, and uh, rent them out for as much as possible. They are notorious for having uh, really high uh, eviction rates uh, for contributing to high housing costs and displacement. Uh, I mean, they're just private equity whose goal is to like take up homes and extract as much profit from it regardless of who lives there. And this is their SEC filings where they were saying to the government, hey, this is how our business works. Uh, and the quotes are, um, they believe that they will continue to uh, experience low levels of housing construction in its markets and therefore they will be able to have higher rent charges and home costs down the line. Uh, they are explicitly trying to buy homes that have, interestingly, strong employment growth and constrained levels of home construction, because as a result, they know that their um, housing markets will outperform the broader U.S. housing market, which means rents will go up really high and the home values will go up high at a faster rate than others at other areas. Um, they claim that supply and demand fundamentals have driven the strong rental rate growth and home price appreciation, which is what they're profiting over which is what they're profiting off of. And then ultimately they fear, they know that it will cut into their profits if they see overbuilding, which would result in the high supply of homes, which would reduce their occupancy rates and therefore also their rental rates. Uh, they know that the development of apartment buildings and condominium units in their markets will increase the supply of housing and therefore exacerbate competition for residents cause them to lower rents and decrease prices. This is like, 
not only do I want this, not only do we need more homes because like everyone who studies this uh, and looks at the data knows that we need more homes, we also need it because those who profit off the housing crisis are also advocating for uh, a lack of housing. They know that they profit off of this. So that, yeah, that, that, um, that kind of answers uh, my last question, which was if what all you're saying is true, why wouldn't the government just pour money into this? Like developers are some of the richest people in the world. If building the most housing was both good for people and good for developers, I'm having trouble wrapping my head around why isn't the government pouring money into this? Why aren't they giving money to developers? Why haven't, like lobbying is so effective in the world. Like why mm -hmm. isn't it happening? Is it working class people working against their own self-interest? Is it because people richer than developers, like very, very small percent of people, uh, are they, do they disagree and they want working class people to be housing insecure because that helps them? It, is it the powers of local government strong enough that NIMBYs are thwarting the most powerful people in the world with their zoning mm -hmm. laws. Like on a global scale, why isn't why is this a not why isn't this a non-issue? Like yeah, why aren't so, there just more housing? Yeah, so that requires you fundamentally understand. Yeah. The big thing is that like, yeah, developers are not the same people, or like real estate is not homogenous. Like real estate has massive amounts of money and power. Um, and real estate is primarily dominated by um, landlords, people who actually currently own the land. And they see their profits increasing with no effort on their part at all, simply by blocking other housing. So like, I think we think developers as, as like this huge, powerful, enriched, wealthy political force because we tend to conflate them also with landlords. Um, but my equity residential, the people who own, uh, the private equity firm that owns like Longview Apartments and Cronin's Landing, they aren't developers, they're landlords. They are profiting off this housing shortage and they are not advocating for more housing. Mm -hmm. Like all the people who have this massive amount of wealth from owning like real estate, they are landlords who are profiting off the uh, housing shortage. And that is distinct from developers. And yeah, sometimes there are developers who are also landlords. In that case, mm -hmm. like I don't know how they spend their money lobbying. But when it comes to like current real estate market, um, the people who actually own all the housing, those are landlords uh, who have, who profit off the housing crisis. Those are not developers. Um, yeah, which is not to say like developers are like virtuous. No, they're not virtuous. Um, yeah, you're not saying that. But that is like the reason why our politics are like that. Um, that and also just like the large power that NIMBYs have in local government and local department is who currently has the power to like uh, establish zoning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I would not say you want me over. I mean, if what you're saying is true, then yeah, mm -hmm. I guess I agree with you, but yeah. it's, it's hard to wrap my head around it. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think a big thing, like I, I generally do leave this part for last because I think I, this is what's most persuasive for yeah, me. Yeah, no, very, very much so. Very much. Like, so. like the power of capital is not the power of developers. The power of mm -hmm. capital is the power of people who already own like resource, who already own land. Like that is what capital is. And mm -hmm. that is landlords. Uh, and landlords are the political force, which are primarily profiting off of this housing shortage and like working to perpetuate it. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also in your earlier graph showing that housing prices actually go down. And so people that own houses being against this kind of stuff, it makes sense to me. It makes sense why we're in the position we're in then. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's basically like an alliance of single family homeowners and landlords, uh, which fight any new housing development because they don't want their current existing property to devalue in any way. They only want it, they only see it as an investment vehicle that should get more, that should have more and more money, should have more and more value at an ever accelerating rate, which fucks over anyone who is both A, trying to be a new home buyer, or B, a renter who doesn't and, have property and that's just fucking getting fucked over. And uh, like like we were talking about, it's a very easy talking point for them to give to working class people to say, you know, it, you're going to be displaced if they build these things. And it's an easy thing to believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. No, yeah. Oh. Okay.
right? <laughs> I will digest this information. People feel free to comment on this as well. Uh, I hope, hope we learn a little bit about this. And looking forward to continue working with you, Tom. Looking forward to continue learning more about this. And also, one thing, uh, the META's Communities Act is going to happen. So I'm mm -hmm. interested to see what it does. Yeah, like you said, the MBTA Communities Act is going to be happening. And it's very important we are advocating for our local legislators to do it in a way, to comply with the MBTA Communities Act in a way that will improve affordability. Like I was mentioned earlier, if we just upzone Southside, which already has 15 units per acre, that isn't going to do jack shit for affordability. All it's going to lead to is easier teardowns and more dis displacement. What we need to do is be advocating for more development in our current industrial and low density zones. We need to be advocating for upzoning single family neighborhoods, such as these near the Brandeis Roberts station. And we need to be advocating for upzoning industrial areas, such as those around Lexington Street and along, uh, along Felton Street and along the river. Yeah, as a final note, um, yes, please get into the comments to continue this discussion, but I'd just like to preempt some comments just with this. So first, Central thesis I'm arguing, solution to the housing crisis, build more homes. It's not just me, tons of people acknowledge this. Um, but to preempt some comments um, that may say, but what about renter protections? What about building affordable housing? What about building social or public housing? What about rental assistance? What about making universities build more student housing because they believe students are the cause of the housing crisis? The answer to all these questions is yes. None of these are at odds with building more homes. Just to preempt some of these in the comments, like I feel like a lot of discussion goes around, oh, but shouldn't we do this? Shouldn't we be doing this instead? Shouldn't we be doing this instead? None of these things are mutually exclusive. All of these things can and should be done to address the housing crisis because the housing crisis is a big issue that we should be throwing all our resources at, not just one or the other. But fundamentally, we do not have enough homes to house everyone who wants to live in Waltham. So I hope you take away from this that building more housing is an, like, is an integral part of doing so. And building market rate housing is like A, the easiest kind to build, and B, does have tangible and visible benefits for low-income neighborhoods and low-income people who live near these new residential developments. OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Tom, for, for coming on. Yeah, I'm looking forward to looking forward to more talking more about this. All right, for sure. Peace. Thanks, everyone.